You are officially invited. Yes, you. You're invited to join us in Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. This is my 10-week group coaching program designed to help you gain confidence using fertility awareness. Whether you're actively avoiding pregnancy or looking to optimize your cycles for conception, we have a spot for you. We start the first week of May. Are you ready to jump in? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash fam. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 412. Welcome to the Fertility Friday podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I teach women's health professionals how to utilize the menstrual cycle as a vital sign in their practices, and I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with me today. Today, I'm sharing a brand new episode in my Pill Reality series. I'm sharing my interview with Jennifer, and she shares her experience with IUD, but also with the birth control pill and what it was like switching to different methods and things like that, which is very common. And so you'll get a sense of a few different methods and what her experience was like, what the insertion was like, all of those types of details. And uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode. So I'm really excited to be here today with Jennifer. Jennifer and I connected, I think it was over social media because you had shared your experience with the your with the IUD essentially. And mm-hmm. I felt compelled to reach out and give you an opportunity to share your experience on air. So I'm really excited that you're here with us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here, excited to share. <laughs> yes. Well, and before we hit record, we were just chatting a little bit about giving space to share your personal experiences. And so I always find it to be really interesting. Over the years, I found these episodes to just be really compelling. I love also because of the work that I do, I hear a lot of stories. So the podcast allows me to actually share this. So it's, I feel like I'm sharing the burden. It's not a burden Mm -hmm. to hear the stories, but as you can imagine, like, for example, the analogy I would use is like, I have a lot of friends who are nurses. (laughs) And if you ever get to a room with nurses, they tell you just the I mean, sometimes it's like gross, you know, bodily fluids and stuff like that, but sometimes it's really tragic and traumatic, the types of things that they've experienced. And anyways, so I guess my point is that the podcast gives an opportunity to just share these stories. So if you've experienced something like this, you know that you're not alone. And if you're just kind of learning about these things, it's to say, yeah, like IUDs have a lot of positives, but some Mm -hmm. women experience some of those negative side effects that we should talk about. So with that said, let's jump into it. I love starting these conversations by asking you just to share a little bit about how old you were when you had your first period, what that was like, and kind of what led you, you know, a little bit about your birth control history. And I think that's probably a good place to dive in. Sure. So I was one of the lucky ones who started my period when I was 10 years old and I was in grade four, the first of all my friends. And it was embarrassing, um, I guess, because I'd never, I didn't know what it was for the, like my mom had never told me, which recently when I talked to her about it, she had said the reason she never talked to me about my period before was because her mom never talked to her and just told her to go talk to her sister. So I was like, Oh, that makes sense. Why she would be uncomfortable talking to me about it. So I kind of went through that 
And then I didn't tell my friends or anything until I was maybe in grade five, going to grade six. And they had all been like, whoa, what is that like? Oh, so cool. And I thought they would be like grossed out by it, but they were all very into it and very supportive. And yeah, it was always very nice to get that support from them. And then once they started to get their cycles, then they would come to me and ask questions. I don't remember much about it, but it was kind of neat and didn't have many issues with it. Can't think of anything that was like a big red flag, some nausea. But other than that, it was yeah, pretty easy going, <laughs> pretty regular. So well, just to kind of jump in there, I've heard women obviously get their periods at different times. So 10 is obviously quite young. Yeah. And actually my one of my really, really good friends, like in fourth grade, I remember she was in your shoes. So she got mm-hmm. her period first. She started developing breasts first before I even knew what it was. So I'm, I can distinctly remember this time when she said, like, I need to go to the store to get pads. And I'm thinking like a pad of paper, like, <laughs> cause I literally was so young that I just, it just completely. So the question out of that is that over the years, you know, I've spoken to a lot of women who got their period really young. You're the first to say it was great. To be honest, so I've, I've spoken oh. to a lot of women for whom they had their period so young and it was traumatizing. They just had no idea what was going on. They thought they were dying. But in your case, it was actually kind of a positive thing. I'm just, I just wanted to kind of comment on oh. that and ask you about that. Well, I guess, okay. So it wasn't all that positive, but I'm just kind of thinking of these things now. I mean, it was positive. If, like, I mean, that's really good. It was more, it was a little traumatic at the beginning because I had literally no idea what was going on. I was like, oh, okay, I'll just put that in the laundry. That's probably going to go away. And then my mom took me to the drugstore, Shoppers Drug Mart. And, you know, she saw someone she knew and she was holding pads in her hand and waved them in the air to wave hello to someone she knew. And I was so embarrassed. But I guess if that's the worst that comes out of it, that's like really not bad. Yeah. <laughs> but it was nice, I guess. Yeah, that I did have good friends and yeah, it wasn't like horrible. I've never had a long cycle. I've never had horrible cramps. Sometimes, like, I think it just depends on my diet and that usually impacts, I mean, I think that impacts a lot of your health and aspects of your life. So, but overall, yeah, it's not been horrible. And I guess that leads into the birth control aspect mm-hmm. of it a bit and why I decided to go on birth control because if there was really no reason for me to go on the birth control pill. So that's what I started out on. I was going into college. I went into college white at 17 because my birthday is late. So I was like, well, you're in college, you go on birth control, right? Even though I had no intentions of like having sex or anything because I didn't want to at the time. And I no boyfriend, nothing. I was just like, that's what you do, right? Go on birth control. So I did no reason. It's really interesting. Yep. My doctor was just like, oh yeah, sure. Here you go. And I kind of made up some reason like, Oh, I don't want acne. Like, I mean, and it was like, acne yeah. and like a concern for you. Yeah, it was like, it wasn't great, but I think that was just hormones. You're developing, you know, it should sort itself out. I mean, I still have it, but it's not, I don't really think of it as a big issue. Like, I don't know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I was on hormonal birth control, like the pill for three years, about three and a half. So from 17 to about 21 or almost 21 went off because a friend was talking about how it's actually not great for your body. And I was like, Oh, interesting. I never heard that before. So I was like, well, I'm like, never had sex. I have no need to use birth control. I've, why would I ever use it? So I was like, well, I'll just go off of it. Like made an appointment with the doctor. And he was like, Oh, you didn't have to make an appointment. You can just go off whenever. Like, oh, okay. So there's no like weaning off process or anything. So I lived my life for three years, right? It's all good. I don't know, no issues with like my period or any cramping or really pretty easy. I don't know. <laughs> well, and what's um just a couple things, like I guess this is my like educator, you know, charting brain. Mm-hmm. So you had your first period about 10. Yeah. And then you said that so it's similar to me. I'm a November mm-hmm. baby. So 
Um, yeah. When I went to university, I was also se- 17. <laughs> oh, okay, good. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so I know uh, what you mean. But so that means that you had seven years of cycling and the way you've described your cycles were like entirely uneventful, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I don't remember much about it. Yeah. And usually, like, I mean, if there's something horrific, you remember it. So yeah. So your cycles then from the, the perspective of like everything we've talked about on the podcast over the years had enough time to mature, you know, your mm-hmm. hormones organize themselves. And it sounds like you said, I never had a long cycle. I never had a problematic cycle. So it sounds like your cycles were pretty consistent and mm-hmm. so, and mature. And so when you went on the pill, you were taking your mature cycles, like it's, it's different once your cycles have developed, because what I have found is that, and I, and what the research would suggest as well. So I'll try to make this brief because I could go off about this for a long time, but what the research would suggest when you're looking at the research studies that show what happens to the cycle when women come off birth control is that women who come off birth control and either don't get their period for a long time or come off birth control and have really kind of long irregular cycles or that kind of thing for like ongoing, they would indicate that a large percentage of those women had cycle issues prior. Whereas if you have women who were normally cycling, everything was great. Their cycles were mature and they go on contraceptives. They're more likely to then resume normal cycling Mm -hmm. in a more timely manner. Um, So I think this is something that's really important as well. And it speaks to just, you know, we're not all the same. And so this is why like some women have very few issues with contraceptives, like one of the reasons potentially, and why other women may have other issues with it. Because again, you know, Mm -hmm. at least some of you listening never really thought about that before. Like, oh, well, having normal cycles and coming, going on the pill at 17 after seven years of cycling is different than going on the pill at age 13 after one year of irregular cycling. Mm -hmm. These two things are not the same. Yeah. I guess I never correlated that, but I mean, I'd never really thought back to what my cycles were like that much. Just, you know, I don't know they happened. I'm developing now. Great. Neat. Let's get on with life. I mean, (laughs) it was kind of an inconvenience at times, you know, like you're going to summer camp and you're like, oh no, what do I do? I have to pack all these things. Do I have enough? Like pads or tampons, but nothing horrible, like someone who's experiencing horrible cramping, irregular cycles, long cycles, or anything like that. Like that's tough, but that also didn't last. Well, I mean, my cycles are still regular and all of that, but it turned out that birth control ended up causing a lot of stomach issues and gut health issues, which didn't come about until maybe two years after I stopped taking it, which I did not, I didn't really know that could be a possibility. I just thought it came out of nowhere. And then I did some research and found out that birth control can be a cause or like it can cause the side effects of like irritated gut issues and stuff like that. Well, so you said that you took the pill for about three years. Mm-hmm. And during that time, like, did you notice anything? And then when you stop, because you stopped taking it because of kind of like, mm-hmm. oh, a friend of mine told me that maybe it's not the greatest thing. And and yeah. also for you, it's it sounded like it was very methodical because it was also like, well, I'm not currently using it for the yeah. stated purpose. Like I'm not currently using it for birth control. So I it kind of like either way, it doesn't matter. So I could just come off of it and see how I feel. But mm-hmm. at the time when you came off, did you notice anything that was different or while you were on it or anything? Not right away. It happened maybe about, maybe it was about two years after that, but I didn't realize it was because of that. It was just, I started having horrible, horrible pain in my stomach. Like anytime I ate food, it would be, I was on the floor, like cold sweats, just horrible pain and doctors couldn't figure out what's wrong. So I just kind of was like, well, I guess, you know, I'll just go living my life and Was it like all of a sudden you had all these problems or was it kind of like, because of course the skeptical person listening who's like, well, if it happened two years after she came off, how would you know that it was like, what would make you think that it was caused by that? So we do know obviously that the pill does disrupt gut flora and Mm -hmm. there's, there's some research that, that shows that for example, women who are, who have IBS symptoms or 
like it makes it worse. Like for women who have IBS or Crohn's or colitis, like there's this correlation between pill use, particularly long-term and the exacerbation of those things. So we do know that there's a connection, but in your case, what kind of caused you to draw that conclusion? Well, I guess it was, it did happen semi-gradually. It started out with like kind of a little bit of pain, but then it would be almost every day, same time, which I know sounds a little bit like, oh, it was probably something else, but I'd never experienced anything like that before, ever. So, and it took a few years to figure out that that could be connected because I ended up going to a naturopath about a year ago. And he's the one who actually has like helped me and has helped me with a bunch of stuff related to healing from the birth control pill, which has been really, really nice. And I mean, yeah, since I didn't really realize it right away that it could have been birth control, I can't really, like, I didn't think about it. I was just like, well, I guess this is what I experienced now. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And I don't go to the doctor, so I don't, I don't really think about it. I'm like, I can deal with it myself. So I'd go to a walk-in clinic if I ever had to go to the doctor, got some ultrasounds. They said nothing's wrong. I was like, well, I feel pretty awful. I don't know. <laughs> Something must be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how, how it works. I think, I mean, this is something I talk about on the podcast a lot too, which is that Mm -hmm. it's, it it can take time to put the kind of two and two together, because if you go on hormonal contraceptives, I mean, most of the women, there's a couple, like there's been a handful, maybe like one or two women I've spoken to over the years who said that their doctor actually did open the insert in the office and actually went through it. Like, it's like a rare thing. Mm but the like 99% of the women that I've spoken to have not had that experience. And so the challenge is that there's all these potential effects that would seem completely unrelated, like gut issues Mm -hmm. or, you know, repeated yeast infections because of the disrupted gut flora or what have you, you know, anxiety, Mm -hmm. panic attacks. And sometimes those things, while a person is on the pill, like sometimes you're on the pill for a couple of years and you don't have any panic attacks. And then like four or five, six, seven years into the pill, that's when you start getting the panic attacks. So you would never even think that it could be related because you've already been on it for Mm -hmm. however many years. So, so yeah, all of those things kind of exacerbate the problem. Mm -hmm. So you went off of the pill, you developed these gut problems, you gradually kind of figured out what they were related to and et cetera, et cetera. And then during this time, uh, it sounds like you weren't highly sexually active or anything. So, um, so then kind of bring us into your, um, like when you actually like needed a birth control and we're yeah. looking into that option. So, um, and it's a, cause it sounds like the naturopath helped you to work on some of those gut issues. So hopefully oh, those yeah. have improved. Yes. So it's kind of a law. I mean, it's a long story and I'm trying to make it short, but it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So I did end up there was a brief time that I went on birth control again for like maybe a month or two, just because I like almost got married. And then, and so I was like, Oh, I'll prepare because I'm not sexually active until I get married. So prepare. And then, you know, didn't work. So happy about that, but um, it all worked out. So then about a year later, I ended up being engaged. This makes me sound crazy. I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, I don't think it does. (laughs) Okay. So I ended up a lot of people have relationships that like don't work out. You're, you're not, you're in good company. Okay, good. (laughs) So yeah, shortly after that, I started dating my now husband. So about three or four months before we ended up getting married, I decided to do the same thing. I was like, well, I don't know what else to do. I'll start on birth control and then we'll figure it out from there. So in September, I started of 2019. So I started on the birth control pill. I was like, okay, great. I still did not know about my gut issues or that it was related necessarily, but I was like, I just want something that I know I can kind of rely on for the first part of being married and then figure things out. So I was just, I believed you could get pregnant anytime. So up even until recently, not recently, but like, you know, past year or two. So in September, went on the pill. And then by November, I had gained 25 pounds after not changing my diet, not changing my exercise routine. I exercise five to six times a week, pretty heavily. I'm not inactive and I gained 25 pounds, 
right before your wedding. And I mean, no. <laughs> not I'm still the way I was, I wasn't, I mean, I was a little upset, I guess, because I didn't feel like myself. My body felt weird and off and hurting because of this excess weight on my five foot frame that just does not hold weight very well. <laughs> so I didn't know what had caused it. And I kept taking the pill. So January, 2020, I get married and I kept staying on the pill for about a month into that, into the marriage. And I was crazy emotional, insane. Don't know what was going on. I flip so fast. So I was like, you know what? I'm going off this. And my husband was like, very supportive he's very supportive about everything so I was like okay I'm doing this like going off of it and then I kind of a few months later it clicked like the gut issues and the weight gain I was like birth control why else would I just gain 25 pounds haven't changed my eating I've been not dieting but I've been eating a lot more fresh food instead of processed you know just to prepare for the wedding and I still gained weight. So I realized then that that's when it all connected. And then that's a few months later, I found a naturopath and he helped me. And I mean, that's where I am today, I guess. I don't know if I need to fill anything in. (laughs) No. So that is, yeah, that's like a really, it's interesting how these things, how these things kind of work. I think that women often fall into different categories. So in your case, you did take the pill for three years, but you didn't necessarily, it doesn't sound like you noticed anything abrupt. Mm -hmm. So it could have been a different brand. It was the same brand. Lowest That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, because then this time it resulted in weight gain and mood changes and things like that. Like, well, I think I noticed the mood changes because I was actually living with my husband, when I got married, because I didn't really notice them before, but as soon as we got married, I was like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> I'm yeah. Not this type of person. I am, I don't know what's going on. Maybe it was because we were just newly married and trying to figure things out, but he's very chill. He's not, <laughs> we like, we're not very, I don't know, wild fighters or anything. So I was like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. But I guess I forgot to mention Throughout that, I also did have an IUD. So after going off birth control, it took a while to get the IUD because of the way Canadian stuff works. You probably know <laughs> all how it takes sometimes a bit of time to just get things going, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, so I don't know. We can talk about that now. Yeah, well, so you went off the pill because mm-hmm. it obviously was messing with your emotions. Yeah. Um, and so, and then it took a little while, but then what prompted you? So tell us about the IUD, you know, was it a suggestion from your doctor? Was it your research? Um, was it mm-hmm. hormonal or non-hormonal? Give us the lid in on your IUD. Sure. So the IUD, copper IUD, that's where I got the mini, I forget the brand, but it was a mini because they recommended that since I'd never given birth. So And I specifically wanted copper. I asked for that because it was non-hormonal and a few of my friends had had it. And I heard mixed reviews. One friend hated it, did not want it. And I was like, okay, good to know that. My other friend loved it. Best thing ever. So I had both ends and I was like, well, I don't know what will be good for me. So I went with it and I did it, got it inserted. And it was one of the most painful experiences I've ever had Hmm. in my life. (laughs) So it, he inserted it and I ended up, so I teach fitness classes. So the next day I was like, oh, I'm fine. I can teach fitness class, like a dance fitness type thing. And I did that and I was like, okay. And I was like sore, but then for about until my six week checkup, I was in pain basically every day from it. And I I was like, is this normal? And he's like, yep, it should be fine. Like, you know, could you describe, I always ask for more specific details for the mm-hmm. listeners. Could you describe the insertion pain? Like, I mean, sometimes I use the pain scale, like zero from zero to 10, like zero, no pain. You're sitting on a beach, mm-hmm. 10, the most intense pain you can imagine. Like, was it like just when they inserted it, was there residual cramping? And then you mentioned six weeks. So what was, what type of pain? were you experiencing during that time? So when he inserted it, it was more like there was a definite like 
he described it as a pinch, but it was more of like a, I don't know, like a twist and a pinch, like okay. all at once, which I did not love. And then I was sitting in the car after and just kind of, okay, you can drive, you can do this, mm. <laughs> you can drive home. And it was more like there's this, I could feel it in me, which I was like, maybe that's just because like I had something shoved inside of me. Like, of course, there was a lot of stuff touching around in there that I'm just going to be feeling different. So that was more, it, that wasn't painful. It was just uncomfortable. But then the next few weeks, it was just insane cramping. I've never experienced that before. It was like, sometimes I would describe it as like a knife stabbing from like my tailbone straight to kind of my uterus, if that kind of gives an idea. Yeah. Which that, um... like, I don't know if that's what people experience during regular menstrual cramps. And uh, if that is the case, I am so sorry that that is you mm. because that was horrible. So then those cramps lasted about six weeks. The doctor said it was totally normal. Great. I was like, okay. I mean, I don't like it, but if it's normal, it should go away soon. I hope. And it didn't. <laughs> I so, just want to take, like, I just, I feel like I have to, I just have to like, you know, yeah. But like how, like we, like, it's an interesting world we live in where you just mm-hmm. described how it feels like someone's like taking a knife and like stabbing your mm-hmm. uterus from the inside. And like, that's normal. Like, yeah. Totally so for fine. the record, like, no, it's not like, no, mm-hmm. like there's no one who's like healthy, who has like, you know what I mean? Like perfect mm-hmm. uterine health no inflammation, no problems, who's walking around feeling like they're being stabbed in the uterus. Like this isn't like how, in what world, but I'm going to stop. Just had to say oh it. no, you can keep going if you want, because like I can't, if I, I keep going, I may that. never stop. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna stop. I, mean, I may never stop either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just, it was a lot. So I got it inserted. Let's see. It took like three months to finally get the appointment with IU because I had to go through multiple doctors since my doctor didn't like do it or anything or like insert them. But so that was September of 2020. So then by, I want to say I got it out eight months later, but I, that was basically the same pain I would experience the week before my menstrual cycle. And then the week of, and I've always had light periods, probably four to five days maximum, very light, relatively easy. Like if there was a cramp, it was like, it wasn't anything to talk about. Like it was like, Oh, okay, cool. Like great. Or it'd be more of like discomfort, not actual cramping. But this time it was just, I'd be driving and I'd have to, like, I'd almost have to pull over. I'd keep your eyes open, focus on the road, like endure this cramp because it was that again, the same knife kind of feeling you would get that yeah. when you had your period now. Yeah. So, and the week before, so that'd be about two weeks of feeling that. When previously then, you obviously had nothing yeah. to speak of. Yes. Nothing to speak of. What else? It was like painful sex was something that I noticed, but I was trying to ignore it. I'm like, no, this feels the same. This is great. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I don't know if that was I've been told it was maybe in my head by a doctor, but <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, I just, like, I can't, like, it's just, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not you, it's, it's me. Like, it's like, yeah. I, yeah, I, it, I guess what it is, is like so many women have had a similar experience and this goes back like centuries where you are trying to get medical help for a problem and you're told that there is no problem you're imagining it yeah I mean like that's insane and super Mm -hmm. unethical it it was and it was from my not my family doctor so like it was just from some guy who inserted it because he could do it so he didn't know me he didn't know my background or history or anything and since I don't go to the doctor for things I just try and deal with it I was like well I won't call him after my six-week checkup because you know everything's fine should be normal should dissipate after a few months you know the pain so I was just kind of kept going I was trying to push it out for a year but could only last eight months <laughs> mm. but my periods were insanely heavy lasted the full seven days 
Like, so I use a menstrual cup and I would empty about two a day. They were completely full, which I've, that is wild to me for at least my personal cycle. Well, just for reference, like for the listener, like what, uh, how, what was it before? Maybe a cup a day at the, on the very first day, mm-hmm. or the second day, and then. And it would gradually taper. So it's definitely two or three times from oh, what yeah. you're describing, like what the bleeding yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. And it would last like days and then. Yeah, because it normally be yeah, four to five days of just, you know, bleeding, but the last two days of my normal cycle are very light. Like don't need a tampon, just a liner and you're good to go. But yeah, with the IUD, it was heavy, which I've heard is normal and well like, yeah, like it's pretty common yeah. because the, yeah. the so the copper IUD functions, I think I feel like I've heard people say like, they're not necessarily sure exactly how it functions, but they know that it causes localized inflammation. So Mm -hmm. within the uterus, it is causing some degree of localized inflammation and the Mm -hmm. copper itself is said to have an anti-sperm effect. Uh, So between those two factors, so it's very common then for women to have more bleeding. What's interesting is I've, I've done, you know, a number of these. So for some women, and you would have, been a good candidate, right? Because you didn't have heavy or painful mm-hmm. periods prior. So you actually would have been a good candidate in that sense, because I've spoken to some women who their, you know, their periods were actually pretty manageable, fine. And so when they went, when they had the IUD inserted, the copper IUD, the increased bleeding um, wasn't necessarily a problem. And, so, and not everybody has like these cramping episodes and like pain. Um, mm-hmm. So for some women, it's fine generally like, sure speaking but for bleeding. others yeah it's like yeah. and I just have to say as well that it's like the, I feel like it's the elephant in the room I don't know if I'm the only one that feels that way but like if you have a procedure right that involves your cervix like so the insertion and then you have all this pain and it's residual and then it causes all these problems like my question is like is it actually doing damage like did it damage something mm-hmm. and then so tell us about like getting it out like did you have periods after like how were they better were they worse were they the same or like like was this something that changed your periods moving forward or was it something that resolved once you had it out so I guess the first cycle after I had it out it was heavier than normal but it wasn't as long but it wasn't as heavy as when I was on or like the IUD was inside of me and then the next one it was basically what I like had before and so getting the copper IUD out kind of correlated with when I discovered the podcast. So I ended up, I was like, oh, this is perfect. I can start like kind of learning to cite or like chart and at least chart what's going on while still like using birth control or like a, I was using a diaphragm. So what I found, I loved, <laughs> I was like, why did no one tell me? Okay. That's not true. My friend told me about it before I got married and I was like oh that sounds like oh weird no and it has been amazing so I don't know why it's not discussed by the doctors more but and she told me that too and she was like they didn't really want me to use it you know and sorry I kind of got off track there what was the question <laughs> well no, oh, no, how that's, was the period like yeah yeah but that's that's really how and it, it, like the the podcast isn't like pro diaphragm everyone should use a diaphragm like the point is that like every woman is different like so we should have all the options because for some women the diaphragm like I have friends who use diaphragms Mm -hmm. and they love it and it's worked for them for decades like I have friends who use all the options and everyone's different and we should be presented with them Mm -hmm. like I wish we were and even when I was trying to look it up on google I could barely find any information about it None. So I'd go on DuckDuckGo and it was like, oh, wow, look at that. Look at all this information about diet. Like, yeah, that's okay. a whole other. Con- so oh. like, I just like, I just keep wanting to like, so I was talking to a friend the other day, like for anyone who's as old as me. So I'm almost 40. Like, okay. so, I mean, I didn't have the internet in high school. That's how mm-hmm. old I am. And uh, when I went to, like, I didn't have a computer at home. Like when I was in uh, high school either. And when I went to university, that was the first time I bought my first computer and I was using the internet for the first time. Anyways, my point 
is that I remember when Google first came out. So again, that's how old I am. And I remember because there was Google and there was like a couple other search engine options. But back in the day, Google was excellent. So good. So everything you wanted, it was like it was in your brain. And Mm -hmm. you would, it would be like the actual thing that you were searching for used to be at the top. Right there. And this is why everybody switched to it because it was better than the other ones. Because the other ones Mm -hmm. wouldn't, like the, the technology just wasn't there. It's time, ladies. Time to take your fertility awareness knowledge and confidence to the next level. Just popping into today's episode to invite you to join us for the next round of Fertility Awareness Mastery Live. My 10-week group coaching program is designed to help you unlock the secrets of your menstrual cycle. Fertility Awareness Mastery teaches you everything you need to know about using fertility awareness cycle tracking to achieve your intentions. Whether you're currently trying to get pregnant, avoiding pregnancy, or planning to conceive in the future, we've got you covered. This program goes deep. Get to the root of your period problems, hormone imbalances, fertility challenges, and so much more. Early bird registration is now open, but only for a limited time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam to register today. That's fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M. Now let's go ahead and jump back into today's episode. So that means that they have the capability to show you what you want, but they're manipulating what you see. In yeah. case anyone didn't know, like, <laughs> like I can remember like before times <laughs> when Google was yeah. excellent and now I can't. If I'm, if I'm looking for something, I have to try to find a different search engine or whatever, and often mm-hmm. have to be very, very creative with my search terms to actually find what I'm looking for. Cause it just doesn't show up anymore. Yeah. You always have to know exactly what you're trying to type in, even if you don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, and there's certain people that are blocked, right? So mm-hmm. like you literally would have to know who they are and search their name and the, like, I can give an example. <laughs> I used to back in the day, like 10 years ago, maybe. 15 uh, wellness mama, every, like everything you searched wellness mama, if you search coconut oil, wellness mama used to come up all the time. Oh. But this is just my experience. Like maybe someone else can remember this too, but like you could search all these random things and it was always wellness mama, wellness mama, wellness mama never comes up anymore. Poor thing. She's lost I mean, all of her organic traffic. Oh, that's <laughs> this so is awful. an example. There's hundreds, if not thousands of, oh, yeah. of people. Oh, anyway, this is like a whole other topic. So lost. <laughs> <laughs> we should stick to the, we should say, but you mentioned it. And I just had to like, cause, oh. cause what that does then yeah. is if you're looking for a diaphragm, uh, either you like, I don't know, I haven't searched now and you know, now I'm curious, but what could happen is if you search, you could see all these articles to discourage you to say that it doesn't work. Um, That's exactly what I got. Yeah. And so then you don't yeah. actually like, you're legitimately looking for information. You're just like, I want to learn about a diaphragm. And I'm going to put diaphragm in there. And then instead of getting like the articles that are like giving you information about the diaphragm and giving Mm -hmm. you even the, so, you know, obviously there's perfect use and typical use statistics. And obviously Mm -hmm. the diaphragm doesn't have as high of a typical use statistic as some of the other methods. Right. Right. But again, if you just genuinely search diaphragm these days, you probably get all of this stuff about like, don't use them. They don't work. It's not affected. Da, da, da. Mm-hmm. And so this is what I mean. I mean, like back in the day, if you search diaphragm, you wouldn't get like 50 articles telling you not to use it. Like you, <laughs> you would get like just random, like information about it, like a definition and potentially mm-hmm. a couple places where you might be able to buy them or et cetera. Yeah. It was very hard to find the specific one I was looking for because it kept like, I don't know, it wouldn't show up. I would look up like where to buy the Kaya diaphragm in Canada. And it was very hard. I had to go to like the fifth page or something. Like it was, <laughs> I mean, I know people don't do that, but it was, yeah. it was a lot, but anyways. Yes. Um, <laughs> we'll Cause this should be a, an episode of itself. Cause now you, I'm always fired up, but now you have me fired up about this, but, but we'll move on. So, but you, the, the point is that you did get information about it. So mm-hmm. how did you, like, did you end up using the Kaya or, cause there was a time when you could go to your doctor and they would have a fitting kit for diaphragms and they would fit yeah, you for the diaphragm. That. Yeah. And Which, so you could, you used to be able to go to your doctor, say, I want a diaphragm. The doctor mm-hmm. would know not, not only just no, but they would also have the tools to be able to fit you. So, cause there's different sizes, there's European websites you can go to and order mm-hmm. them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think I had to go to a European website. 
I think that's yeah. where I went. Yeah. And so you <laughs> like, this is it. So for everybody yeah. who doesn't know, like you can, but the hard thing is that like those websites, you would have to know the size. So you kind of have to like mm-hmm. guess the size or, but there was a time when you could go to the doctor and some doctors still do this, but again, like if your doctor's maybe 75 or older, like you're more likely to have, and I'm not being ageist here. I'm saying mm-hmm. that there's certain things that you know, because the times have changed legitimately, the younger doctors do not have some of those skills that the older doctors had, but yes, there was legitimately a time you could go to the doctor. They would measure you, fit you. So you would get the correct size and they would give you a prescription and order the diaphragm and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But nowadays, if you go to your doctor and ask for a diaphragm, they look like, look at you, like you have three breasts or something. Yeah. Which is kind of what happened to me when I got my IUD out and I told the doctor all my issues and the reason why I was getting them out or getting the IUD out, which was because I guess I didn't explain all of the side effects I was experiencing, which I feel like are other women may have experienced them too. And it's not normal, even if the doctor says it's not possible or it's only in your head, which is what he told me to my face, that it's not possible to experience what I just told him. (laughs) So I was getting it taken out. And right before he was like, okay, so why are you doing this? And I was like, painful sex, bowel movements are incredibly painful and it's like pinchy and weird. And that's never been an issue with me. I can never fully empty my bladder. It feels like it's like pressing against it. I feel like I always have to pee, but I can never fully empty it. And just like the insane cramping. I feel like there was other stuff too, but it was just so much. And I was like, I'm fed up. And again, my husband, very supportive, was like, you need to figure out what's best for your body. You need to, like, this isn't working for you. (laughs) It's not making you feel good. (laughs) So, yeah, I kind of wanted to add that in too, because the doctor said it was not possible to be feeling that. So then he asked, well, why don't we just put in a hormonal IUD? I was like, I just told you that I don't want hormones in my body. And he's like, it's very small. I was like, but, I just told you that's not what I want. And I'm using a diaphragm and he kind of was like, that's not going to work. So that was kind of (laughs) neat. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, you know, first of all, I mean, I appreciate you being here and sharing your experience. I think this, this is why I do this. I Mm -hmm. do this for so many reasons. As, as I talked about the very top of the show, one to just share it, just to give you the opportunity to share it because, you know, with, you know, 5,000 of your closest friends, but yeah. like, because but this is a thing. And this is why, like, I have a lot of private sessions with clients, like any of the listeners who I've worked with, like you've shared things with me and all of those kinds of things. But in this forum, it's not just me who hears it. And this mm-hmm. is why it's important. Cause one of the comments I get about these episodes is like, Oh, it just sounds like you're talking. And we are like, we're, we're just, yeah. it's literally you and I talking about this just as I would. And these are the types of conversations because I mean, I guess what it comes down to is that as much education as doctors have you, no one will know your body and your experience better Mm -hmm. than you because only you can know your body and your experience because you live in your body. And so they can say whatever they want, but if you didn't have any of these (laughs) effects, Mm -hmm. sex was not painful. Bowel movements were normal. You didn't have pain with your periods. And like the only thing that changed was the IUD and the insertion was painful. And when you're mm-hmm. having that type of experience, the pain is probably kind of similar to the pain you experienced with insertion because mm-hmm. right. Like, so, yeah. so then back to the question, like that was like a huge tangent away. Cause, but, yeah. but I want to get back to that, <laughs> but no, it was, it was important for a number of reasons, but so when you had it out, you had mentioned that your first, like the bleeding was mm-hmm. the first time a bit less, like sounds like maybe half, mm-hmm. but still yeah. more than you did. But then yeah. by the second period, it seemed like it was kind of normalizing more. Mm-hmm. And what about the pain and the pain with sex? So when he took it out immediately, like the pressure that was inside of me, like I always said that I thought I could feel it in me, even for the eight months, like I thought I could. And, you know, I was told that that's just in your head. So I was like, well, maybe it is like it very well could be because you know, something's there, but it was just, it was sore. But immediately when he took it out, I started crying. I was so embarrassed, but I started crying because it was just like, in a, like the pressure was gone. Everything was gone. I was like, this is what I used to feel like. 
I did not like, I was so thankful. Like, so I was sitting on this table, like my legs are spread <laughs> and he's like, here's the IUD. This was what was inside of you. And I'm like, oh, that's so great. I'm just crying, <laughs> like, wow. you know? So it was a little embarrassing, but also like, I don't really care because I feel better and I'm kind of back to where I was. I mean, like now that I'm pregnant, I'm not <laughs> exactly. Like, well, which, so tell us about that. You just slipped it in there. So I, yeah, I knew because you had told me, but yeah. Um, so yeah. So tell us about that. Like how, I think what, what we had talked about before the episode was like, well, the IUD obviously works because yeah. the pregnancy, like that's one benefit, right? Obviously it was yeah. preventing pregnancy. There was a lot of but other. But it's not like I wanted to have sex when I was in pain anyways. So it was like during the fertile days, I wasn't really having sex anyhow. So I was like, this hurts. Um, I mean, I was, but it was like not as frequent or great, but taking the IUD out had nothing to do with me deciding to have babies. So I would like to put that out there to the doctor. If he was just happening to listen, it's not because the diaphragm didn't work. It's because we actively chose to have children. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, clearly the IUD did work. And I think, I don't know if the birth control pill, since I was off of it for so long, it like, I was fine after or like I didn't have any issues because I know it's not everyone has issues getting pregnant after they come off the pill either so I don't well, know the but... one good thing I mean not one good thing so again there's mm-hmm. there's pros and cons obviously to the IUD mm-hmm. your your experience is is obviously like not what anyone wants obviously quite a negative experience mm-hmm. with it but the, the generally speaking right the positives of the copper IUD is that it is non-hormonal that you mm-hmm. do continue to cycle. And so you do continue to ovulate, you make mm-hmm. cervical fluid, you have a true actual menstrual period, which can only happen after ovulation. In the experience that you described, you had taken the pill for three years prior, and then you kind of t- had a little stint and then you had mm-hmm. another little stint, but the stint was like two months or so from, if I'm remembering correctly from what you said, four, or, or, I think four months. Okay. Four months. September to January. Is that four months? Five months something like four or five months in the general scheme. Like when we talk about the the transition period and things like that, there is a difference between what is referred to in the research as long-term use. And that is Mm -hmm. two or more years typically is what the research defines as long-term use. So again, there is a difference between taking it for four to five months. Like it doesn't mean you can't have effects. It doesn't mean it may not take a couple of cycles for things to normalize, but there is a difference between a few months versus several Mm -hmm. years. Like these things are typically different. And then also because you were using a non-hormonal method, I mean, you were having a lot of problems but it sounds like you were still ovulating and having your period. And so that would have like allowed you to cycle mm-hmm. and anything. Right. Yeah. So, so just to kind of talk that through that in that scenario, even with all of that happening, mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that you'd have any issues when you're ready to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. I was just kind of concerned. I was like, what if it damages it or what, if, what if it has been damaging my like insides in some way or anything like that? I was just concerned about that, but it turns out that yeah, I mean, getting pregnant was. I mean, I don't like saying that it was easy for us because I know there's so many people out there who have a. But really that was hard your experience. Time. We yeah, you did get pregnant when you wanted to. So, mm-hmm. I mean, and I it is it is what it is. Yeah, uh, obviously, just, not everybody has that experience, but I feel like we should all be able to share our mm-hmm. experience. Yeah, but I just know there's so many people who can't, and I, I mean, I don't know what it's like, so I can't relate. Really I'm always thinking. Of it's not like you had like a walk in the park and ju- like you had, <laughs> you had a different kind of experience, right? It's different like kind, nothing yeah. you described sounded fun or, or, you know, anything like that. Yeah. And in terms of da- like damage. And so this is something where I would love to see more research on this. I mean, in order mm-hmm. for the research to take place, we would have to have a medical establishment that acknowledged that there is a problem yeah. with insertion. Yeah. As you were talking about this, this only occurred to me in this conversation. I've had a lot of these types of conversations, but so controversial or not, when a woman terminates a pregnancy, depending on how far along she is, there's a standard procedure to give her things to dilate the cervix. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, it just never occurred to me, you know, 
when you have a woman who's never had a baby, the cervix is not open. And that is when they're having the most pain and issues with insertion. And so Mm -hmm. it just makes you wonder, you know, I always said, okay, there's numbing things you can do and et cetera, but I don't know if there's like, this is a question I don't know. Like, I don't know if there's a potential for damaging. There's, there's many Mm -hmm. women who like, there's a whole, um, I think there's a a Twitter account called Intex cervix or something like that. Like there are groups of women who are talking about whether or not this could have these types of procedures could have a negative effect on the cervix. So it, it's a, it's a topic that, but until the medical establishment acknowledges that it's even a possibility, if, if we don't even mm-hmm. ask the question, we obviously can't do the research, but it just occurred to me, you know, like, is it a thing? Like, could we do some, some degree of dilation instead of just pretending like it's just fine to be yeah. basically traumatizing the cervix in this way. So mm-hmm. I, there's so many possible solutions to this problem that are not being you like, cause it, it occurred to me, cause even if you use numbing, you could potentially, like, you don't feel the pain, but you could potentially do damage. If, I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. what like if you did kind of, dilation? Yeah. Like my husband even kind of, I brought it up to him and he's like, I kind of thought of that too. Like that could be an issue. I mean, like, would they just shove that. something like that up the penis? No. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, the most that from my understanding, I don't know all the procedures men have to go through, but you know, when they do an STI test, they take like a swab and like swab it on the inside of the urethra, but that's not the same as shoving something up the urethra. Mm-hmm. Right. No, so unless it's like a catheter or something, but yeah, which is a whole mm-hmm. other level of mm-hmm. discomfort. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Um, but, but either way, like, we're not going to solve this on today's podcast, but I mean, I don't think I'm here to solve the, all the problems, but I'd like to ask some of these questions and hopefully get people thinking, because ultimately, mm-hmm. if you have an experience that is actually physically painful and, tra- and physically traumatic, like pain is a sign of some sort yeah. of physical trauma or inflammation or whatever. So we shouldn't be sitting there if someone says, that's oh, fine. It's normal. It's great. Like, mm, right. No. Which, it was <laughs> again about my naturopath, Dr. Shaw in St. Jacobs, if anyone is in the area in Ontario you're close to me. oh oh yeah you're near Toronto yeah yeah, yeah so I've been to um, St. Jacob's it's so lovely oh yeah it's real cute all those Mennonites I mean that's my ancestry so <laughs> yeah. um but Dr. Shaw he I he allowed me to use his name and like share him I was like is this okay if I mention like you did wonders and he was like oh that's great awesome so Right after I got my IUD out, I just happened to have my like three month checkup appointment with my naturopath. And I told him about the experience and I told him about what I was going through because I just got it inserted like the month before I started going to him. So he kind of had been with me the whole journey. And he, as opposed to the other doctor who said, no, that's not possible. This isn't a thing. It's on your head. He like affirmed everything. And he was like, yes, of course you've been feeling that way. I'm actually really happy that you got it removed. And Mm -hmm. like, so it was a totally different experience. And that's why I don't really go to doctors much because I'd prefer to go somewhere that actually has been listening to me rather than someone who just is like, no, that's in your head. Even though my family doctor is very good. I would like to say that like, he's been very good with some personal family stuff with my parent or my dad and stuff like that, that we've been going through. So he's, he's been very good. <laughs> well, yeah, but, I mean, this is, I think it's, there's so many different factors to consider mm-hmm. what you've described is certainly an argument for finding mm-hmm. a good practitioner, mm-hmm. finding a doctor who does know you and who does know your background and history, who you have a relationship with, who respects you so that if you do have certain issues, even if you don't agree with everything, you know, like, mm-hmm you can still be respected and, and try Mm -hmm. to be supported. Cause ultimately I feel like one of the most important traits of a, of a practitioner is, is just literally caring (laughs) about you as a person. Yeah. And if we had that level of like, I'm going to trust my patient and I'm not going to tell her that she's imagining pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I feel like the, the world would be a little, everything Mm -hmm. be a little smoother. Yeah. But as we, as we kind of wrap up today and and bring this, I guess, honestly, I could talk to you all day. Like, I feel like (laughs) this has been a ride for the listeners. Like we've really covered a lot of crap. No, no, no. This is good. This is real life. Like this is how this is, I mean, honestly, right. Like this is how real conversations go. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And I talk to my friends about this all the time. Like I am not shy to share this with my friends, their husband, like this is what happened to me. 
<laughs> well, and there's so, so like, this is why it's so important to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that, you know, if you get a copper IUD, you're going to have this experience, no. but learn, like listening yeah. to the, especially these IUD episodes, it was very eye opening. It has been extremely eye opening for me to, to conduct these interviews over the years and to speak to clients mm-hmm. about these things, because I was not aware that almost all So almost all of the women who I've interviewed and the clients I've spoken to who've had an IUD have experienced moderate to severe insertion pain. And many have Mm -hmm. gone on to experience a lot of pain afterwards as well. So this is not an isolated incident. Like this is something that, and it it opened my eyes. I mean, logically, I I was, I I was always personally afraid of (laughs) the IUD. I had bad period pain. I was like, nothing that could make this worse. Like I'm already good in the pain department. Um, But hearing these stories has really opened my eyes to it. So if there's mm-hmm. one takeaway, it's that you should have a conversation with your doctor about insertion. If you're thinking mm-hmm. about getting an IUD and know that you do have the option to request numbing, they should be offering it automatically. And you could potentially ask your doctor if you've never had children before, like, is there a possibility to do some dilation? Like I've heard these horror mm-hmm. stories and I really want the IUD, but I want to minimize my trauma mm-hmm. to the cervix. Like, I feel like we have to be empowered to be able to ask or else we <laughs> we would never even think to ask. So with yeah. all of that said, what is, you know, if there's one thing the listener could take away from our call today, like what would you want it to be? So everyone is different. Every's body reacts differently to whatever it is you choose, but just kind of learn and maybe take notes. I don't know if this is making any sense, but take notes about what is happening and kind of collect them. And if something feels off, you should you should really try and figure it out. Don't try and push through it and just be like, it's fine. Everyone else is probably dealing with this too, because they might not be, it might not be normal. And I mean, you should really look into it if it's not something that's comfortable or I don't know. There's a lot I could say, but I think that that's so important. Yeah. And like, even if someone tells you it's in your head, Mm -hmm. like, it basically ignore them and keep going until you get help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that's why I choose to go with a natural doctor because even though I have to pay for him because of Canada rather than like my family doctor, I'd much rather prefer to go with him that like, even though I have to pay extra money because I know he'll help. So find someone who will help you. I don't know. I find it's hard in Canada because you can't really switch doctors because like, there's limitations on how many they're accepting and yeah. stuff and shortages and all that. It's public. It's publicly funded. Public. So it's different. It's more yeah. like doctor led versus patient led. Like you kind of have yeah. to take what they give you instead of demanding mm-hmm. them to do something for you. Yeah. So yeah, it's but a different I never kind of, go to doctors. compared to our American <laughs> okay. friends. Cause if you're paying yeah. for care, it's different. They can't just oh, do yeah. whatever they want. Like you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they have to like actually listen, but not just not to like, can, you know, there's a lot of oh, positives yeah. about can, Canadian health. Yeah. Like we're not going to get into that. I'm not trying to bash no. Canadian healthcare. Canadian healthcare no, is, I'm just saying like, there's, there's a lot of positives about it, but there's also some challenges is what we're trying to say. It is nuanced. Yeah. yeah. Especially <laughs> um, if you're in a very like, uh, what is it? Populated area. It's yeah. Well, and, and typically, I mean, I've never found it to be I mean, I don't know though. I think I feel like I've never found it to be that difficult to find a doctor, but at the same time, I've always had a doctor. So then like, right. I've never yeah. had to face the like, right. So, so I, mm-hmm. I guess I see what you're saying. And yeah, Canada has its challenges. The United States has a challenge. Like it's mm-hmm. very yeah. different, but yeah. Different but before we go on another tangent, I just want to thank you so much for being on the show today. This was such an important conversation. I'm just really thrilled that you felt comfortable comfortable enough to come on the show and share your mm-hmm. your story and i know that this episode will be very just empowering and eye-opening for mm-hmm. the listeners so thank you so much for being here oh you're welcome lisa thank you for listening if you enjoyed today's show please share it with a friend you'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com 412 i hope that you enjoyed today's episode with jennifer I really do love these episodes. I love having conversations with real women about their experiences using contraceptives because I think it's just important for everyone to hear. And I I feel like it gives an outlet. So in my work behind the scenes, this is what I do day in and day out. So I spend my days having conversations with women, talking about their experiences with birth control, supporting them to learn fertility awareness and to use it for whatever their intentions are. 
So many of my clients are wanting to use fertility awareness for birth control. Many of them have switched from hormonal methods or other methods. And, you know, many of my clients are trying to conceive. And so in that case, they're wanting to understand their cycle, but usually also wanting to dive deeper into the vital sign piece of it. So what can you learn from your cycle? Is there anything I've missed? Are there hormonal imbalances? What can I do to improve those, those types of things? And so in those conversations, these are the types of stories that I hear all the time. And so it's been, I find it to be really nice uh, to have the podcast as a way to share that. I think uh, it can, over time, I mean, I've heard so many stories, not all of them are positive, right? I've heard a lot of negative stories, a lot of negative experiences. And I think the podcast allows that not to just be in private. Obviously, everyone who's on the show knows they're going to be on the show. So it's not like that kind of situation. But it allows these conversations to happen in a public sphere so that it's not just me hearing these stories day in and day out. I share them with you so that you can hear them too. It's just so important for women to feel that they're not alone, that they're not crazy. You know, it's not just you. There's other people who've had similar experiences. I think it's important not to downplay or minimize these experiences because so often that's what happens in our culture. And even if you have negative experiences and you go to your practitioners, often they're kind of like, oh, well, you know, wait it out. Oh, you know, it's fine. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And ultimately it's not fine. So hopefully these episodes help to put things into perspective. So obviously we're not trying to overblow it and make it into a bigger deal than it is. But we're trying to acknowledge that there are issues and many women face said issues. And one of the things that generally strikes me when I start a brand new Fertility Awareness Mastery Live group program is I'm in a virtual room with several women who have usually within the group, there's at least a few who have come off of birth control. But often it's, you know, many women come off of birth control, not necessarily because they wanted to, but because they have spent so many years dealing with whatever side effects that they're experiencing, that they start to feel either crazy or frustrated or uh, really feeling like they're at the end of the rope, feeling like there's no other options for them. There's no other choices for them, that they just have to go through it. It's just part of being a woman. Even some of those beliefs around menstruation as being a curse and having, you know, this is just what my lot in life is. I have to kind of suffer through this stuff. And the, the kinds of stories that I hear, even if you go back and listen to the Pill Reality series. So again, uh, if you want to tune into more of these specific episodes, fertilityfriday.com slash pill reality. But if you tune into some of these episodes, you hear some of those things where a person is experiencing a lot of negative stuff and they continue to deal with it for six months, eight months, a year or more, just because that's kind of what we do (laughs) as women. Even if you just look at the issue of period pain as a separate issue from birth control, many women just suffer with it. And ultimately, we just don't feel that we have the options. Many of us have tried, you know, everything under the sun and have never really experienced any relief. And so you just feel like you're stuck, you know, and hopefully, you know, these types of conversations just help you to realize like it doesn't have to be that way. There are other options. And especially as it relates to the birth control conversation, hormonal methods are an option. They're not necessarily right for everybody at every point in their lives, but they are an actual legitimate option for those who have the you know opportunity and time and I suppose desire to dedicate to learning it. So hopefully these episodes, especially if you're listening and you're kind of on the fence, you've been thinking about it for a while, obviously not to push you before you're ready, but just to give you that confidence so that you can avoid pregnancy until you're ready to conceive. Or if you have no plans of having children to feel confident about using this method to prevent pregnancy to the highest possible efficacy. So again, that's fertilityfriday.com slash BAM. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week weekend whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.